In a previous lesson, we took a look at what are known as measures of central tendency, and those are generally referred to as mean, median, and mode. There are also a couple of variations on mean that we talked about. Another thing that we're interested in when we're looking at the statistics of a single variable is how much does the data spread around those central measures. So we determined how to calculate or determine the central value of our data, but it's actually important to also know is the data tightly spaced around that central value or is the data quite broadly spread around that value. And you can see I've actually uh, got on this first page just a list of definitions. So spread, that's basically the first broad idea that we want to look at. Uh, how closely a set of data clusters around its center. And its center can have different meanings. It depends on which measure of central tendency you are focusing on. Range is a calculation, the difference between highest and lowest values of the data set. So basically how broad is the span of the data or how much is the data spread. We're also going to be talking about percentiles. Now I've got these definitions up here uh, and if we were in a class I would normally just have you write those definitions down so you can read these, you can pause the video to read these or to actually add these to your notes. And I'm going to be talking about each of these last three, percentiles, quartiles, and interquartile range, will really make more sense once we actually try to apply them in an example. Spread and range are definitions that you can get an idea about just by reading them. They make quite a bit of sense just from their definitions. So let's go ahead and proceed with some examples because I think that's the best way to illustrate these concepts. And of course I say that but I've got some more definitions. This is more of a, a definition of, of a how-to. So one of the ways that we visualize spread is using something known as a box and whisker plot. And I've got an example down here at the bottom of the page of a box and whisker plot. And you can see the box part is a rectangle. The, uh, the, the, the box represents, you can see the median is the measure of central tendency that we would make use of for a box and whisker plot. And then we have a thing called a lower quartile and an upper quartile. Between the lower quartile and the upper quartile, that's half of the data. So this box includes half of all the data. And then the whiskers represent the other 25% going in either direction. So inside here is 25% of the data, inside here is 25%, 25%, along that whisker is 25%, and along that whisker will be 25%. Once you know these values, the, the plotting of a box and whisker plot is actually fairly simple, but you need to know how to do the calculations in order to come up with these various locations. Where should they be and what should they be? Okay, so let's start off with a set of data. It's just an example. I don't know if I saw this or made it up or modified something. So we've imagined our data comes from a survey at a sci-fi convention. And the respondents are asked how many times they've seen the original Star Wars film. And these were the values that they gave. So some people had seen it a few times. Some people had only seen it once. Some people had seen it, the highest number was up to 30 times. That seems a bit extreme. Um, so, and also, geeky, uh, geeky admission here, I saw the original Star Wars seven times in the theaters when I was a little kid, when it came out. So, there's me, right there. Um, that being the case, let's take a look at, uh, well, we're going to want, first of all, we want to do a sorted list because we are interested in, and I think that's on the next page, or not the next page, yes, sort the list and find the quartiles. We're interested in finding the quartiles. As I mentioned when we looked at the box and whisker plot, the box and whisker plot, which makes use of the quartiles, is interested in the median. And the way that we find the median is we need a sorted list. So we need a sorted list in order to find the median. And it turns out we also need a sorted list in order to find 
the quartiles. So I have done that part for you and for me to be honest. Uh, here is the sorted list and now I'm going to find the quartiles. Now the first thing we need to make use of here is how many pieces of data do we have? And if you count it out, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And I already knew that because actually I covered that. I used this same list of data points in looking at some measures of central tendency. So in this case, n is equal to 20. And so that means that my midpoint is going to be 10 pieces of data on either side. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So here are 10 pieces of data. Here are 10 pieces of data. So when we did measures of central tendency, what we found was that the, the median was equal to 5.5. Now, another thing that we can do from here, well, with 20 pieces of data, then 20 divided by 4 is equal to 5. So what does that tell us? That tells us that each quartile uh, is 5 pieces of data. Now, it's not always going to work out nicely like this. Although, if I or if your textbook or your, whatever resources you're looking at are, are being kind, they'll usually give you something that's divisible by 4 to try to spare you some of the awkward um, truncations you'd have to deal with. So for 5 pieces of data, that means that there's my first 5, there's my second 5, here is my third 5, and there's my fourth 5. So what does that mean? Well, actually, I've chosen this, so this is relatively nice. Between 3 and 3, this is quarter 1, and that is equal to 3. It occurs at 3. Here is quarter, not 2, I'm sorry. This one is quarter 3, and that's equal to 10. And of course, the reason for that is because in the middle here, this is actually, the median is also known as the second quartile value. So quartile 1, quartile 2, quartile 3. So the first quartile goes up to 3, the second quartile goes up to 5.5, the third quartile goes up to 10, and technically the fourth quartile goes up to 30. We don't normally... Uh, explicitly refer to that fourth value, but we will when we graph it. So we'll make use of those values as our end values for our box and whisker plot. So there we go. We've sorted the list and we have found the quartiles. And I've just copied that data and brought it forward because now we're going to create our box and whisker plot for the data. So what we do is we first of all locate the Technically, you could do this in, in any order you want to. Let's locate quartile 1. That is at 3. And so that's going to be halfway between 2 and 4. Now, the scale on my graph here doesn't lend itself to, to great precision, but um, meaning I don't have a grid line at 3. But that doesn't matter in this case. We're, we're just trying to get a look at the spread of the data. We do have a grid line at 10. And we have a median of 5.5. So here is 5, so halfway between. So that would be 5.5. Now I'm going to do a box plot. So you would use a ruler. I'm going to use a um, just a straight line tool. So I'm going to make it, I'll make it too high. So those are each of my quartiles. I'll join that on that side. And just to emphasize it a bit, I'll join it down here at the bottom. So there is the box part of the box and whisker plot. And then we also make use of this value 30, which is the upper limit, which is over here. And I'm going to put my whiskers along this 
line that's one unit away from the baseline. So I'll put a dot there to indicate that's the end of that side. And then at 1, which is halfway between 0 and 2, I'll put another dot there to indicate, and I'm going to try to emphasize that a little bit more. And then I'm going to go back to my straight line tool. You could, of course, just do this with a ruler. And there is one of the whiskers, and there is the other one. So as I pointed out before, that means that 25% of the data is here. 25% of the data is here. The, the upper 25%, the upper quartile, is spread out over this relatively long whisker. And then the lower 25% is spread out along this quite short whisker. So as you can see, so what does the box and whisker plot accomplish for us? It shows us the clustering of the data and it shows us how much it's spread. So from 1 to 30, that's the range of the data from the lowest data point to the highest data point. But the majority of this data is clustered in the lower end. The median was 5.5 and the majority of the data is clustered around it. And then it spreads out more and more as we go into higher numbers. So that is an example of measuring the spread of the data. Now, sometimes you will do something called a modified box plot because you don't necessarily want to include outliers in your data. Now, you do have to be very careful. And in an introductory course like this, we're not going to be able to get into the real subtlety of outliers because from a statistical point of view, it's very tempting to view any piece of data that's inconvenient for your experiment or for your results as an outlier. And so a lot of people, even some very smart people, will make the mistake of discarding outliers from their data when they're really not entitled to do so. But when you are trying to present a result, the less spread you have in your data, the more compelling your result will look. And so some people tend to discard outliers and there have actually been some very famous cases of some, some fairly you know, kind of high level scientific research where they have discarded outliers and they didn't have a right to do so. They made their results look a lot better than they actually were. So there is a formal procedure for doing that with a modified box plot. So if you follow a set of rules, you are allowed to do this. So in this case, the formal procedure says that um, if you calculate this thing called the interquartile range you are allowed to dis you can you can figure out a maximum distance based on the interquartile range iqr and any data outside of this can be classified as an outlier so this is one very simple technique for identifying an outlier so once again back to our star wars survey data and you can see I've, I've already, now I've already marked, there's quartile one, quartile two, quartile three. So the first thing we need to do is to calculate the interquartile range. Now the interquartile range, if we go all the way back to our definitions, the interquartile range tells us the range between quartile one and quartile three. So basically, the interquartile range is saying how wide is the box part of your box plot. So we can just do that calculation here. The interquartile range is equal to Q3 minus Q1, which is equal to 10 minus 3. That's equal to 7. And then we have to figure out what our outliers would be. Well, what we need to do is then we have to do what's this calculation? What's 1.5 times the interquartile range? Well, that's equal to, let me put it underneath, that's 1.5 times 7, and 1.5 times 7 is 10.5. And now that I've done that one, well, what's the maximum value? that I'm allowed to have. 
the maximum value is going to be Q3 plus 10.5. So basically it's saying I'm going to go to the quartile 3, but I'm only going to stretch my whisker up to 10.5 units away from Q3. And so what does that give me? Q3 is equal to 10 plus 10.5. So I get a maximum value of 20.5. Based on this max value of 20.5, I come up and look at my data. I'm going to discard 30 because it's outside of that, that maximum. My minimum value is I go down here to Q1 and I subtract 1.5 times the interquartile range, which is Q1 minus 10.5, and that's going to be 3 minus 10.5, which is negative 7.5. And the lowest data point we have here is 1, so for this one we have no discards. You don't have to write this, I'm just, I'm just putting it in there to make it explicit. In this one, I discarded 30, whereas with this one, I'm not discarding any data. So that's how you do your calculation to determine your outliers. And you can see that I've just repeated those here. My interquartile range was 7. That gave my minimum limit to be negative 7.5. My maximum limit, 20.5, so I throw away 30. And now I redo my box and whisker plot. It's going to be very similar to what we had before. I actually could have copied that. Um, here at 3, 5.5 uh, and 10. Those are the quartile values. And at 1, I still have one of my... I have my lower limit, but instead now my upper limit is 16. And so it actually results in quite a dramatic difference to the overall plot. And now I'm going to fill in the pieces. So here is my box portion. And you can see the lower end of the box looks the same as it did before, but in discarding that single outlier, the, the, the measure or the visual indicator on the spread of this data, it's actually not nearly so spread out as it appeared to be. And that's one of the reasons why it's valid to discard an outlier, so long as you have a good mathematical or statistical reason for doing so. Because in this case, you can see the data is actually much more strongly clustered in the lower end. It's definitely skewed to the left. There's more data on the left side in a tighter pack than there is on the right side. But it's still uh, the overall spread of the data is a lot less than we were originally led to believe. So that's the idea of quartiles and interquartile range and box and whisker plots. Now another way that we can look at these things is what's known as percentiles. And you may have heard of these. Um, quite often, I think the most common use that I can think of is when people talk about uh, test scores. And they'll talk about, well, that test score was in the 90th percentile, or that test score was in the 99th percentile, or something along those lines. Um, so that's what this calculation tells us. And it basically looks at, so when we talk about the 90th percentile, if we say someone's test score is in the 90th percentile, they're saying that 90% of the people scored less than that person. So that's the main part of this calculation, which is how many values are to the left or are lower than that value. And we're going to go through an example where we make use of this. And then we also have what's known as the percentile rank. This is just doing the same calculation, but you're trying to get a different piece of data. So for the percentile calculation, we take a particular score and we figure out which percentile it's in. For the percentile rank calculation, we are given a particular percentile and we figure out what score is associated with that. 
So let's say I want to know, well, what score do I need to get in order to land in the 95th percentile? So I would, I already know what percentile I want, and then this is going to tell me which data point is associated with that. And then I can just look up that particular data point, and then I know which rank it is. Again, we'll use an, an example to hopefully illustrate this. Okay, so one last time, the Star Wars data. I have included the Star Wars data already sorted because you do need to sort the data for this to work because you're talking about scores that are lower than the one that you're looking for. So first of all, I want to figure out what's the percentile for a value of 4. So how many values are lower than 4? So I'm going to use L for lower, and I'm going to use an index of 4 or a subscript of 4 to say that's the score I'm looking at. Well, how many values are lower than 4? It's all of these values, and that's 2, 4. There are 6 values that are lower than 4. How many values are equal to 4 in our data set? And for the equal to 4, well, it turns out in our data set, we actually have two values that are equal to 4. What other piece of information do we need here? We need to know n, which is the number of pieces of data. We've actually been through that before. n is equal to 20. So now that I know these, I can find for the score of 4, which percentile is the score of 4. And now we can see 4 is actually relatively low here. We don't expect it to be particularly high. Here is Q1, which is the which would be 25% of the way. So I expect my answer is going to be a slightly above 25%. So to figure out the percentile, I multiply by 100. That's just, just like when we calculate a percentage, we multiply by 100. And then I'm going to take L plus 0.5E. So how many scores were below 4? Plus 0 0.5 times the number of scores that are equal to 4 and divide that by 20, which is the total number of scores. And so from there, I do my calculation, and I end up with, let's see, 6 plus 1 divided by 20 times 100. And I end up with 35. So in this case, therefore, um, a score of 4 is in the 35th percentile. And another way of, of expressing that or thinking about that is that if you got a score of 4, then 35% of all scores are below your score. So in this case, score of 4 is not a particularly high score because there are more scores above it than there are below it. You also, uh, this is maybe a good time, you could have said, well, I can just look at that and I can see that. We use fairly modestly sized data sets in order to be able to do this analysis by hand so that we understand where the analysis is coming from. But you have to remember that these things also apply to massive data sets. Now, you wouldn't do those calculations by hand, although once upon a time, that's exactly what people had to do. You would use a computer. Uh, you would use a spreadsheet uh, to, to do these things. And for anything realistic that you would do with this data, that's exactly what you would do. You would use a spreadsheet to do it. Okay, so now the next part, what is the rank or the location for the 80th percentile? So I already know that I want the p-value to be equal to 80, meaning I want the 80th percentile. So it's not 80%, it's the 80th percentile. Notice this doesn't have a percent symbol on it. I So that's the p-value from here. I know the number of pieces of data. That's still equal to 20. So now I'm going to figure out which rank that corresponds to. So I take that p-value, that's 80, divided by 100, and then I do 20 plus 1. And so, of course, 80 divided by 100 is just equal to 0.8. Multiply that by 21, 
and I end up with the rank of 16.8. So in this case, we want to know the rank or the location of the 80th percentile. Now, if I round down here, I would end up with something less than the 80th percentile, which we don't want. So we actually, and this is a kind of subtle thing, we must always round this up. Because that's the, if someone wants to know what the 80th percentile is, the, and, and if you round down, you wouldn't actually be giving them the 80th. So you, you traditionally you'll round up here. Okay. Now, where does that put us? So that's going to put us, the reason we're rounding up is to the 17th rank. And where is the 17th rank? Well, there's 20, 19, 18, 17. So technically, the 80th percentile is a little bit less than 12. But because we need to get at least the 80th percentile, we actually round up there. So in this case, we would say, therefore, uh, the 80th percentile occurs uh, at rank 17 or and what was our value or at a value of 12 or more actually I, I don't I shouldn't say or more there or more is implying above so at a value of 12 you are in the 80th percentile now technically we could be more precise if we w then took this value of 12 and brought it up to our calculation for A, we would actually find that 12 was slightly higher than the 80th percentile. So um, it, it comes down to a precision there. It comes down to how many data points do we have. It's not going to be exact. And I believe that's it for our lesson and our examples. And there is some assigned work to help you practice this.